Give it up for our band. Really amazing stuff. Uh, a lot of the lyrics were spot on to today's topic on sermon. Uh, we're going to be reading from the book of Revelation. Good times. Uh, we're going to talk about a dragon, a uh, lamb, and a woman. Uh, so let's, get, let's go. Uh, let's pray first, and then we'll stand up and read Revelation chapter 12 together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for this Memorial Day weekend to help us uh, be mindful of those who gave their lives for freedom. Help us be uh, remindful of our loved ones who sacrificed greatly. Uh, help us not be people who take things for granted. Help us be always uh, cognitive of people's sacrifices, small or big. Uh, help us just be people of gratitude. And Lord, I just pray right now as we're about to read this passage, reveal things to us that we need to see. Help us see scripture in a new light today. Uh, give us the strength we need. Be with us right now. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Bind stuff that's not of you right now, and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come, have your way. Have your power. Have your grace. Have your truth. Have your comfort. Just continue to be with us as we're seeking you together through this time of uh, the word. So Lord, let the lips that I'm, and the words that are coming from these lips, let them be beautiful words that speak truth, speak your gospel. Speak your grace, more of you, less of me. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let us rise and read Revelation chapter 12. Uh, I'm going to read the first three, cha uh, first three, and then we'll read the last one together. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in the front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared by her, by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have comes the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of the brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shriek from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. The word of the Lord. So Revelation is one of those passages where it's hard to read from because there's a lot of abuse and in the interpretation. Um, oftentimes people profit off of end times prophecies. They cherry pick certain sections. But it's in canon for a reason. It's the scriptural truth for a reason. And sometimes Revelation doesn't just point to the future. It also points backwards. And most importantly, it points to the eternal. It points to things that are happening in the heavens as we speak right now. And uh, one of the interesting things about Revelation is it's 
the more I read into it, the more it's pragmatic for living out my Christian walk day to day. That includes today's passage. Anyway, about a few years ago, well, not a few years ago, three years ago, I was interviewed on 100 Huntley Street. It's the CBN 700 Club for Canada. I was talking about the war in Artsakh, and they wanted to filter their guests with um, questionnaires, making sure that the guests they bring on are actually Christ followers. And the way they filtered it was with this one question, which I thought was very poignant. When did Jesus become more than a name to you? When was that moment in time when Jesus was no longer just something or some word you heard, but he became more than just a word? For me, as I will tell time and time again, was when I was in high school, I was depressed, I was miserable, I was questioning God's existence, I was in 10th grade, um, I wasn't just going through an angsty teenage phase, I was really questioning the why question. And I felt like if God is not real, all of this feels meaning, meaningless. There's no point. It's just making up stuff and going along the way. I was having these thoughts as a teenager. I think sometimes we undermine what teenagers could think. And then I was questioning God's existence. And it led to this breaking point in the winter break of that year. And back where I was from, winter break meant there was snow and it was cold. And I, I got to a point of completely surrendering to God. I said, God, if you're real, end this pain I'm feeling. In that moment, the Holy Spirit came. I felt adopted and loved by God. Uh, and it wasn't just some abstract sentiment of the Holy Spirit. It was God's presence literally filled the room. It was uh, an amazing moment. I was crying, but there were good tears. I was overwhelmed with peace, love, and joy. And then I ended up picking up the scriptures that night. I turned to John chapter 5, and Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, you're searching the scriptures, expecting to find life but you refuse to come to me to find it for all scripture is about me. And I felt like that unlocked the Bible for me. For the first time, the Bible became a living word. It was a breath of God to me. And I couldn't put the Bible down. I started to enjoy reading for the first time as well. And I saw Jesus in the Old Testament. I saw Jesus in the New Testament. And it was all pointing and bearing witness to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. The Bible contained that revelation that it's all about Jesus. And Jesus is indeed the one who gives life. And I just had a foretaste of that fullness of his life that night. That's my testimony. What is yours? What I love about Church for the Nations is everyone here has a pretty cool testimony. Uh, one of my uh, advisors and friends, he's a, he's a pr president of the Christian Missionary Alliance of Canada. He oversees over 400 churches. And he always says um, to new people going into a new church setting, your first year, try not to do anything. Just keep your mouth shut, <laughs> look, listen, and learn. So the, my first year here, I was looking, listening, and learning. And what I was looking at and learning about was how this church is special and how each and every one of you has a conversion story. There's a high percentage of people here who became Christians later in life, which is kind of unique. Everyone here doesn't seem to have an ulterior agenda and it's such a beautiful thing to be part of this community where that's the case. We are people from different ethnic backgrounds, different stories, yet somehow Jesus came along the way and changed everything. Own your testimony. Share it. It's yours. It's a gift that God has given you to share to other people. It's a reminder for us, a memorial for us to be reminded of that moment or those moments when God broke through and changed everything. Moving forward, I want to bring back the tradition of people sharing their testimonies. Because there's some really cool ones that need to be shared. I want them to have them part of our service. I want people to hear them online. Because I've noticed that the past few conversion stories I heard were based on testimonies. People who were sharing their testimonies it generated their own testimony. And it, it, we're at a point in our society where like, if, if we're in a secular culture and people don't have like the same foundational uh, thinking blocks, you can't logically like prove God's existence to someone who doesn't even have that framework. But you have a story where you could say Jesus came through 
and changed everything. I was addicted to substance, he broke that free. I was depressed and suicidal, now I'm full of life and joy. Uh, I was in the pits. My family was about to implode, but God redeemed it. Whatever your story is, there are so many testimonies of Jesus breaking through and radicalizing redemption arcs. We need to share them. And I want to start collecting them, and I'll send an email out this week. And I would love for each of you to share your testimony during service. Let's get them out there. Again, I, the last two people I heard of who became Christians, what did they do? They were trying everything uh, to fix their problems. They would go to the therapist. They would try this spiritual practice. They would do this and that. And it all came up short until they started hearing testimonies on the internet. Oh, God has indeed done this for that person? God helped someone in that situation? Can God do that for me? And it happened to be the case. Testimony begets testimony. And here in this passage, the weapons we have to fight the darkness is the blood of God in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world, the cross, and our testimony, the life-changing power there is that comes from that cross. So we're in a cosmic war. I hate to break it to you, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you buy into this spiritual framework or not. Right now, as we're speaking, light is fighting darkness. Angels are fighting demons. We are in the crosshairs. We have a role to play in it all. And Jesus already delivered the crushing blow. Uh, we are in this cosmic battle, a spiritual warfare battle. Um, I think it's easy to talk about the problem of evil if you buy into the biblical story, which is that there's Satan and demons and he hates us. Satan hates the church. And there is evil in this world. Um, sometimes people think that's just too simplistic, but it's the reality. As you all are, know, the world is not perfect. You just listen to the news. You just live life a little bit. Things don't go the way they're supposed to go a lot of the times. We are in this cosmic battle. God is not responsible for evil. There is sin, human agency that's responsible for it. There's spiritual forces that are responsible for it. But God is in the business to snuff this all out and to completely redeem all of creation. That's the story of scripture. Jesus came into the darkness. He's the light. And that light is advancing as his church grows, as his kingdom advances. So in this vision, the dragon, uh, the seven-headed red dragon, is told by John that this is Satan, the devil. And he wants to destroy this woman and her child. The child is the Lamb of God, Jesus. Uh, it's by his blood that we are forgiven. It is him who rules the nations. We're church for the nations. The scriptures say, the child that will be born will be the one who rules the nations. Jesus Christ is the one who rules the nations. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will confess his lordship. But who is the woman in this? I actually am not quite sure who is the woman in this vision. I'm not going to pretend like I have the answer here. But who is she? Who is she in this story? Now, there's multiple interpretations. Some say she represents Eve, being the mother of humanity. Others say that she represents the Israelites, because she is the one who will uh, bring about the covenant. Others say that uh, she's Mary, Jesus' mom, which makes sense. While others say she's actually the church. I actually think it's all of the above. And you could read it with all those people in mind. Because all these women, whether it's Israelites, the church, Eve, or Mary, are the ones who bring to life the salvation and the birthing of Christians. Uh, and I love this image here. You have Eve, who's victim of the curse, and the serpent, where there is that prophecy um, after their disobedience, where the serpent says, where God speaks to the serpent, you will bruise humanity's heel, but this offspring that this woman's going to bear will crush your head one day. 
It's called the Proto-Evangelion. It's found in Genesis chapter three. God is proclaiming that one day the reign and terror of the snake will be completely crushed, even though he's going to bruise the heel from the offspring, singular, from Eve. And here you have the shame and the guilt and the sin and the over Eve, but she's putting her hope on the baby that Mary is carrying. And that baby is going to be the one who puts the death blow over the serpent. And I think all of it makes sense, especially the first part is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, where you find from Eve to Mary to Jesus is the fulfillment of scriptures. And then the second part where Satan wages war against the offspring of of Jesus' descendants, our church, is the second part. It's us. Those who hold to the word of the testimony is a reference to Satan waging war against us. And there's this beautiful imagery. Um, if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, uh, there is a scene that Mel Gibson interpreted and put in where Jesus literally is stomping on the snake right before he goes to the cross. Uh, in the Armenian Apostolic Church, where I have roots in, um, when the priest gets up, up on the altar, he's not allowed to wear shoes, but he wears slippers because it's holy ground. And sometimes the slippers would have a, a, um, a snake on it. And it's a reference to Jesus stomping on the snake's authority and power um, up, up as they're uh, doing communion and preaching the word. I think it's all of the above. And that's the beautiful thing about revelation and visions and dreams. Sometimes they could have multi uh, interpretations and it, it requires a skill to be able to interpret the dreams, just like Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph in the New Testament. We get dreams from the Lord, visions from the Lord, and, and then we'd, we'd, be, we'd be very careful on how we interpret it. But the big idea for this whole sermon, if you just, you know, <laughs> go home, it's like, what is he talking about? Dragons, a woman, uh, the, what, this and that, it's Memorial Day weekend, I just want to enjoy my day off tomorrow. If there's one thing to get out of this sermon, there's one thing, it's this. Your weapon against the darkness your weapon against Satan, our main tool to fight victoriously is to know that we have conquered Satan by the blood of the lamb, the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and by the word of our testimony. This is our power, speaking to the truth of the power and the cross of Jesus. As the Apostle Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. It is the power over darkness. It's the power to bring life from death because Jesus' cross does that for us. And what is your testimony? What is your testimony where this is not just some nice idea or nice symbol, but when did the cross of Christ change your life, change your trajectory? Own it. Share it. Use it because it has power. Now, there's different theories on uh, what happened the moment Jesus died. We're going to put on our theological cap on right now. For those who like theology, this is for you. For those who don't, just pray. (laughs) So there's different beliefs or theories on atonement. What happened when Jesus died? What happened on Good Friday? The most popular theory or belief is something called ransom theory. Uh, It's the belief uh, that the early church pretty much focused on where Jesus's death frees us from the power of Satan. There's a spiritual release that we're no longer under the kingdom of darkness, but literally redeemed from that kingdom and brought into the family of God, the kingdom of light. Jesus frees us from spiritual bondage. And there's spiritual power in the name of Jesus, in the cross of Christ, it frees us from evil. Uh, Jesus said in the gospels, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Where's the ransom coming from? He's, he's ransoming us. He's, he's being the sacrifice to free us. He's being that scapegoat that liberates us from the evil one. He's fulfilling the scriptures. Jesus Christ is our ransom. He's our scapegoat. He's the one who gives his life to free us from darkness. Another atonement theories are substitutionary atonements. 
It comes from a guy named St. Anselm. Uh, it's in scripture. The son of man, uh, he, who knew, he who knew no sin became sin so that uh, we could become the righteousness of God. It, it's, it's what most people in the West preach on when they preach the gospel, which is true. Jesus Christ forgives us of our sins on the cross. That's the only way we have forgiveness through that once and for all sacrifice. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, your sins are forgiven. They're gone. They're, they're, they're destroyed. And because our sin is destroyed, we get to have the Holy Spirit living with us. We get to call Jesus as dad, our dad. Only through the cross of Christ is there forgiveness of sins. Only through the cross of Christ is there hope. And no matter what we've done, no matter what's been done to us, no matter how stupid we were, no matter how intentionally evil we were, no matter what we have done, there's love and grace because of the cross. The cross wipes us of our sins. It purifies us from the inward out. The power of the cross, the blood of the lamb, cleanses us from our unrighteousness and makes us right before the living God. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Also, what happens on the cross is Jesus shows us the perfect example of love. He's the one who sets the bar really high and says, follow us, follow me. What are, what are we doing? We're gonna show you what love looks like. We're gonna show us what truth looks like. He's showing us God because God is love and truth. God is full of grace and full of truth. The way of Jesus is one of love. And it's not just sentimental love. It's actual, tangible, sacrificial love. And right before he goes to the cross, he goes, tells his disciples, hey guys, you're not just disciples. You're my friends. And no greater love is this, that someone gives their life for a friend. And what does he do? He does that just for us because he, he loves us as friend. He's our savior. He's our Lord, but he loves us and died for us. He, he actually died for you. He died for you. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There's life on the other side of death because of Jesus. The love of Christ is stronger than death. It's stronger than our sin. It's stronger than the power of Satan. It is our tool. It's our proclamation. It's our war cry. The blood of the lamb and our testimony when this became a reality for us. That's our proclamation. We are a one hit wonder. We just preach the cross and say, Jesus Christ, that's it. That's the only thing we need to proclaim and hold fast to the testimony, that transformative moment. And when God broke through and redeemed us and saved us. When did the cross just become more than a symbol for you? Is the cross just some fashion statement? Is the cross some tattoo you wear? When was the moment where the cross became power over death, power over Satan, forgiveness of sins? The cross is our proclamation. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, it's done, it's finished. There's hope, it's done. So do you have a testimony to give? Now, if anyone here for some reason doesn't have a testimony, give your life to Jesus. What are you waiting for? Just trust him, surrender to him, pray to him. Say, your will be done, now my will be done. Just trust him and everything will change. Everything will change. And for those who do have a testimony, which I know most of you and you do, I'm gonna give you some homework. You ready? You excited for some homework? Yeah. This is also going to be like a homework assignment you're going to deliver during one of these church services. I can help. I will promise to help you. But I remember uh, after my call into ministry, I was doing a lot of campus ministry, and one of my uh, campus ministers said, "Just write your testimony on a one-page page. One page, single space, is like a five-minute talk. Internalize it, own it, articulate it in a way." where when someone asks you, why are you a Christian? You could just communicate it. Uh, and it's important, one, because we're very forgetful creatures and we sometimes take the grace of God for granted. If you look throughout the Old Testament, there's monuments created when God came through. They would, Abraham, Jacob, they would create like monumental spaces where God showed up because they're forgetful. We could be forgetful. It helps us articulate those moments when God came through. 
The other is you'll have a, a better delivery, I guess, in storytelling. I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not a natural storyteller. I had to work on it. And writing it down makes you more articulate and helps you communicate. Um, you don't know how many times I get asked, when did you become, why did you become a pastor? I'm like, I, I'll tell you the story. I wrote it down on a one page paper like 10 years ago and I've told it like a hundred times because that's usually the number one question I get asked. What's your name? What do you do? Okay, I'm a pastor. Why are you a pastor? And then, then I, have a, I, have my, I have my story ready. It's not like I'm fabricating it. It's just, it happened. I just want to write it down, internalize it, and communicate it in a manner that gives honor to God. So think about a testimony that's happened. Write a page, five minutes, three minutes, and share it with us. Testimonies come in all varieties and shapes. Um, there's the salvation test type of testimony where you become a Christian. And sometimes people become Christians like John the Baptist. They grow up in a Christian home. The parents model Christianity. They see the Holy Spirit at work. God the Father is real in the house and in the work, in the ministry. And they just believe. Those are rare, but those are my favorite testimonies. I've talked about this in the past. I want those testimonies for my kids. I don't want some like PK rebellion story and then they find Jesus later in life and become a pastor. I want them to be following Jesus right now and stay that way. There's also the road of Damascus story. Some people have a very dramatic encounter. Jesus literally shows up from heaven and blinds the apostle Paul and he goes, hey, stop persecuting me, knock it off. That testimony happened because people that Paul was persecuting were praying for him. Stephen, right before he died, he was praying for them. Testimonies don't happen randomly, even the dramatic ones. There's always people praying for the dramatic moment to happen. And the apostle Paul had that road to Damascus. We tend to highlight the road to Damascus testimonies a little too much in churches, not that it's wrong to, it's good. But most people tend to have more like a apostle Peter testimony. They get it, then they don't get it. They understand, then they don't understand. They believe, then they reject. And then they're like, okay, I'm willing to die for this. I got it. I'm going to step up and lead. You each have a story. Own it and share it. Don't compare your story with someone else because God has given you this story. It's yours. Now there's other types of testimonies too, not just our salvation testimonies we want to share. We want to share stories of God miraculously healing or redeeming a situation. Sometimes God provides miracles. Sometimes God provides a illogical explanation in a situation. And as a church that prays, we want to make sure we pray and have like a trophy case of all the answered prayers that have taken place with CFTN. Another observation of this church is the prayers get answered here. It's a good place to be part of a community where prayers get answered. So let's keep pressing. Let's keep uh, remembering when God does indeed answer it. Amen? Amen. All right. So you each got a homework assignment. One page. Reach out to me. Tell me when you want to share. I might be asking you if no one reaches out. And I want to, and I want to generate this testimony that begets testimony. Because it's powerful. It's powerful in testimony. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who are the offspring? That's us. We're in, in this vision. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus Christ. When the apostle Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God, he talks about making a stand. He uses the word stand firm like four times in like th three sentences. We got to hold our ground when the enemy attacks, we're firm and unmoving, unwavering. When temptation comes and says, hey, break this commandment, we're like, nope, not going to do it because we're holding on to the commandments of God. When compromise comes through, we are holding fast to not compromise and holding fast to Jesus Christ. That is our power over the evil one. Holding on to the blood and proclamation of the cross, keeping the commandments of Jesus and holding true to the testimony. That's it. We want to gather the testimonies. We want to keep preaching the cross from the Bible and lives get changed. And we have work to do until the end of this age to evangelize, make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing people in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus is with us on this mission. And we do it by preaching Christ crucified, pointing people to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As, the apostle, as John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We at CFTN are telling the world, look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is how he took away my sin. This is how he redeemed my, my situation. This is how he changed my life and helped me see things correctly. It is only because of the cross of Jesus where there's hope and redemption. It is our message. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the secular world, but who cares? It is the power of life over death. Let us be bold, let us preach, and let us share our testimony because it is the power over the evil one. Amen? All right, brothers and sisters, every time we take communion, we're testifying to the once and for all sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night of his betrayal, after giving thanks, he took the bread and said, this is my body given to you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is the blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever we take and we eat, whenever we take and we drink, what are we doing? We're proclaiming his saving death until he returns. Welcome to this table.